Well, hey, y'all, welcome back to church. I want to encourage you once again, as I have been for the past few weeks in a row, we want to be a generous people. We need resource in order to reach people right where they are. So, you know, God calls us to be generous. So there is simply a spiritual side to this. We are called to be tithers. We're called to be generous people. That's what the Bible calls us to. So that's who we need to be. So there is a spiritual side to this. There's a practical side to this. We have to have resources in order to reach people. So listen, if this is your church, I'm going to call you to what the Bible calls calls you to, which is a generosity based out of tithing, which is what God has called every believer to be a part of. The first 10% belongs to God. Keep that in mind. Look it up. As I say in so many of my videos, don't believe me, look it up because it is in there. So uh, so we're at calling you to that on a spiritual side. On a more practical side, if you tithe at your own church, but you're with us from time to time, but you want to help us, uh, help resource us in order to reach more people, we'd ask you to give to that as well. So you can do that by texting WIAC Gives, the word WIAC Gives, no spaces, W-Y-A-C-G-I-V-E-S, WIAC Gives, to the number 94,000. You can also text 53 for 53, which is our campaign, uh, in order to have people give $53 in order to help us reach the 53% of people whose statistics tell us will never darken the doors of a church. So 53 F O R 53, you can text that to 94,000. Both of those will take you to a platform where you can decide and set up how you want to give, how God has called you to give to help us accomplish the mission he has given us. So I want to encourage you to do that. Now, back into the life of Gideon. We've been through a number of iterations now of, 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 of the process God is using to bring Gideon from impoverishment to overcoming, to actual victory. Remember, we are not going to deal in this series of lessons. We're not going to settle for simply coping inside of our impoverishment. We're not going to settle for simply coping with our brokenness. We're going to understand our scars. We're going to understand all these things. We're going to understand our difficulties. We're going to go through that, but we're going to hear from God. We're going to question God because look, a lot of things that happened to us, they're not awesome, and it doesn't make sense. We're going to question him. We are then going to test God along the way to make sure that we are the one God has called us, to, that, is called, that God has called to do this. We're going to do all of that, but we're going to do all of that toward the mindset of overcoming, not just coping. I need us to come, to come to grips with. I want us to process the fact that God has called us to be more than just people who can cope with our reality. God has called us to be his people who are victorious in our reality, who overcome our reality through his power. He didn't just cope with the sin in the world. He destroyed the, he defeated the sin in the world. He came in, he did not just cope with the fact that death had taken over. He came in and through, through his death on a cross and his resurrection for the death, he defeated death and the grave. You see, that's what Jesus has called us to do. And I think Christians have just settled for coping. When in fact, God wants us to absolutely be overcomers. So I want to encourage us to do that. Now, now we have to understand that we have to do this God's way. I think one of the challenges most Christians have is that all of us can look at a situation and have a plan. We create a plan. Here's our plan. We, get, we execute the plan, right? But what if God's plan's not yours? What if God's plan doesn't work out the way yours does? That's what happens in, in, in uh, Judges chapter 7. God starts to shift Gideon's plan. Now, you'll remember that in chapter 6, we started talking about when, when, when he started to follow God, it, it, it actually tested the followers of God, the people of God, so that when Gideon uh, began to announce, began to show that he was going to follow God and he was willing to lead, then other people, the other, the other tribes rallied around him. Uh, we're going to see here, and I'll show you some of the math that we find here, that about 32,000 fighting men rallied around Gideon in this moment when the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all of them came together, and they were going to fight against the Israelites. But, but, but God decides that's not how he wants to do it. And Gideon has to do it God's way, not his way. This is going to happen in our lives. And we got to trust God. So now we're at a point that can we trust God? Chapter 7, Judges, chapter 7, starting verse 1. 
It says, early in the morning, Jeroboam, remember this is the name that was given to Gideon by his neighbors because they basically said if he's going to tear down Baal's altar and he's going to tear down the Asherah pole, then let Baal deal with him. So now he just owns it. You know, okay, I'm the one. If Baal wants to deal with me, Baal can deal with me, but I'm still coming against all of Baal's people. So in the morning, Jeroboam and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. In other words, the two major armies are beginning to face off, so they're, they're, they're apart from each other. The Lord says to Gideon, you have too many men. Wait, let me read that again. The Lord says to Gideon, you have too many men. What? If you're about to go to battle against another army and there are two or three or four different people groups in that army, there's no such thing as too many men. We want to be overwhelming. We want to have so many, so many fighters that this is not even close. But God says, no, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel will boast against me that my own strength has saved me. See, God's math is different from our math. In our math, we want as as much strength and as much power as possible so that when we move in, there's no question before we go in whether we're going to win or not. God's math is very different. God says, I don't want there to be a way that you could claim the victory was yours. I want you to clearly understand and know the victory was mine. He says, he says, if I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel will boast against me. Remember, remember, we're taking Israel and we're viewing them as ourselves. I cannot deliver this hardship into your hands because at this point you're too strong and you will boast against me saying, oh, I did that myself. You see what's happening? That's what's going on here. Now he says, verse 3, Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. Watch. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. 22,000 said, no, I'm scared. I'm going home. And off they went. That's not a great army. By the way, Even though you wish you could have walked into the battle with 32,000 because 10,000 remained, 22 left. That's where the 32 comes from. Even though you wish you could have walked into the battle with 22,000, if you had walked into a traditional fight with 32,000 soldiers, the Midianites came at you in a traditional fight with their however many and attacked. And all of a sudden, those same 22,000 who were afraid and so they decided to leave started to abandon you in a traditional fight. You're, 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 you've lost. You're dead in the water. There's no way you can win that battle. God knew that was about to happen, and God got rid of what looked like strength but was actually weakness. I need you to understand, sometimes God is paring back what you think you have as plenty because he knows what you are viewing as strength is not your strength. It's actually your weakness. It's actually, it's actually a vulnerability. It's a liability. You see, it, you see it as an asset. I have all these men. God sees the liability of it. They're going to run. They're going to turn and run. So go ahead and let them go now so 10,000 are left. Okay. Gideon decides, we're going to come against this other army with 10,000 of us. Okay, that, that's, that's still a strong army, verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. What? 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 you got to be kidding me. Really? Come on. We're down to 10,000, Lord. Don't do that to me. He says, take them down to the water, and I'll thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water, and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water up with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley.
So let's get this straight. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the Eastern peoples have gathered. They have crossed the Jordan. They are threatening. They are threatening uh, uh, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, not really a nation yet. They're just a a bunch of tribes gathered. And once in a while, a judge rises up. Gideon has risen up. 32,000 men have rallied to his cause. He feels pretty good about this. He's ready to face this army with 32,000 men. God says too many. He says, if you're scared, go home. 22,000 of them leave. He's got 10,000 guys who are courageous. Okay, we're going to take them with the 10,000. God says too many. God pairs him down to 300 men. 300 men are all he's left with. You, you, you think that, that, that math doesn't work. But let me say it again. God's math is not like our math. God's math is let me get you to a place where without me moving, there's no way you could win. But when I move and you win, You clearly know it was my hand that did it and not yours. We've got to, and here's the first point I want you to catch in here. There's only two. We've got to trust God with our strength. You you got to trust God with your strength. You think, you think, well, my strength is in the 32,000. And God says, no, that's not where your strength is. Your strength is in the 300. Now, 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 watch. I want to show you something. You may have a, 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 you may have just a boatload of talents a boatload of abilities. You might have just a boatload of resources. You might have a huge, I don't know, bank accounts or a huge family or a huge crowd. You may be putting all of your belief in the strength of your numbers, in the strength of your bank account, in the strength of the people around you, in the strength of your followers, whatever. You may view all of that as an asset, but what God is saying is, I'm going to boil you down to what is actually your assets. This is what's actually going to matter in the end. Because God says, I'm going to use just that core thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to add to it my capacity. And we're going to overcome with what you think are insurmountable odds. We're going to overcome with what you think is nothing. Gideon goes from 32,000 to 300. And when he gets to 300, God says, okay, now's the time. That is so opposite what any of us think. That is so opposite the way any of us think. We all think bigger's better, more's better, more's stronger, more's. But God's saying not true. All you need is me, and I'll see you through this. So Gideon now sits here with 300 men, and down in the valley below him, is the army, the armies of Midian. Verse 9. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am giving, I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the, to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley uh, thick as locusts. Their camels could no no more be counted than the sand of the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend of his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. Now, can I pause just a minute? Gideon has no military background. To our knowledge at this point, he's never taken up a sword. To our knowledge, he's never fought anybody. And yet, look at his reputation. This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash who in the last chapter was threshing wheat in a wine press because he was hiding from the Midianites, who all of a sudden believed that the sword of Gideon is going to destroy them? It's an amazing shift in how they view him. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. Why? Because he knew God had done something he couldn't do. 
he returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into our hands, dividing 300 men into three companies. I want you to notice this. He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Y'all, uh, we're, we're going to get into what they did with the jars and the trumpets and the torches next week. What I want to get into this week is this phrase. This can only, th- th- this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. Now remember, they're freaking out over the sword of Gideon, right? The, the camp of Midian is, is freaking out over Gideon, the mighty warrior, who just last chapter is hiding in a wine press. They're freaking out over over Gideon, the mighty warrior and his mighty army, who've just been reduced from 32,000 to 300. They don't know any of this. If they had any idea that Gideon was hiding just a few weeks ago or that he had been dwindled down to 300 followers, there would have been no fear at all in the camp of Midian. But listen, listen, listen. you got to trust God with your strength and you got to trust God with your story because God's going to take your story and make something out of it. Your story may not be worth anything when it starts. You may may not have anything to work with. But when God takes over that story, people begin to hear it differently. People begin to see it differently. I'll never forget when I first moved to Maryland. I I was moving here from North Carolina. And my my entire, look, I grew up in North, I was born in Florida, but I grew up in North Carolina. So my whole world was in North Carolina. My whole ministry at that point had been in North Carolina, and God called me to Maryland. I didn't know anything about Maryland. I didn't know if I didn't know if it was going to work. I didn't know if I didn't know if I would translate in the culture here. I didn't know anything about it. So I show up for my first meeting uh, with the with with the larger church board. It was the second or third time we'd been here, but we were the larger church group. And I remember walking around. I think I was about to preach my first sermon. I don't think I had preached yet for them. And I heard some lady explaining to someone else in the church the pastor they were bringing in. She was talking about me. And her phrase was, here comes the million-dollar mouth. Well, she'd never heard me preach. Now, I, I could own that if you want me to. I'm making me feel good, million-dollar mouth. Yeah, I don't know. That's she ain't never heard me preach before. She has no idea. Years earlier, I had uh, we had taken a job in in North Carolina, uh, our very first job. I was I was the full time assistant pastor at this church, and I was to be the worship director. And it was our first service, and I stood up to sing a song. I was going to do a solo because our first service they had it. And I, I later on, the pastor that I was working for, my senior pastor, his wife told me later on that day. She said she said I suddenly panicked, and I went, Why did you panic? She said, because you stood up, picked up a microphone and stood on the platform. And I suddenly realized we had never heard you sing before. She said, what if he can't sing? But they had trusted what God had told them to do. Y'all, this happens in our life. God has to take control of our story rather than us by our own strength writing our own story. If by our own strength we try to write our own story, we'll write some poor, broken version of what God really wanted. But if we let God lower our strength but elevate our story, he'll accomplish things in his power that only he could ever do. That's what we have to understand about what's going on here. This is not God trying to a handicap Gideon and the Israelites this is God teaching them that it's not your strength that's going to write your story it's my call it's my plan it's my power that's going to write your story so you know what God's going to do he's going to lower your strength so that through his power he can elevate your story but you have to trust him If you don't trust him, you'll keep the 32,000. And trust me, if you go to war in a traditional format with those 32,000, 22,000 of them are going to turn and run in the first moment. That's going to discourage the last 10,000. You are absolutely going to lose. But if you'll let God do it his way, he'll use your story to then rebuild your strength. And it'll be greater than anything you ever imagined 
You just have to trust him. You say, well, pastor, how am I supposed to get to that level of trust? Well, I don't know. What if we started by hearing from him? Like our first sermon talked about. Questioning him so that we actually understand what's going on. Testing him so that we know we're exactly where we're supposed to be. So that we can trust him when the moment comes to actually put down the 32,000 and go to war against an army so great that the camels can't even be counted. Holding in our hands nothing but trumpets, empty jars, and torches. Y'all, that's trust. But when we trust God like that, he can make our story something that people will always remember because it's all about him. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, you are going to call us to some crazy things. I just, I just know it. I mean, I, I, I can just see moments where, where the, the impossible takes place because you've made it possible, because you've made it happen. So, God, what we ask is that you, you, you take our willingness, our willingness to go to war without a weapon, only, Lord, trusting in your word and your call. Lord, use that. Use that and write a story that brings glory to you. And we will give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen.